Good morning, everyone. Would you please stand as you're able as we sing together here for you. Good morning. It's been a busy morning already. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. A lot of things going on. Um, just a handful of announcements. Um, be in prayer for our many of our people who are traveling this week. I know a lot of our folks are in different parts of the country, and they're on the roads headed home today in different places. We also, ha also have a number of people out sick, and I'm not going to name them by name right now, but just be in prayer because we have a, a fair number of people who are sick. Um, I know one person covered the end or recovering from COVID, but the others are just normal, just flu stuff they're dealing with. But just be in prayer as people are struggling right now. Um, announcement that we have a Christmas concert in Washington. A bunch of us are going to on the 4th. Again, that's in Washington, um, Washington, Illinois. Um, tickets are $5 a piece. I would tell you to talk to Mike Blakemore, but he and his wife are a couple of, uh, they're under the weather. <laughs> so um, reach out to them either on Wednesday or um, or sometime during the week, we can get you tickets. But if you're wanting to go to that and you haven't got tickets, let me know, and I'll get you added to that list. 
Um, also, a reminder that next week, um, our first Sunday of December, we are starting services monthly, once a month, at the Villas. That's the new um, assisted living and memory care outside of town. It'll be 1.30 on Sunday, after, or Sunday afternoon. And um, we're looking for about five or six people that would be willing just to go with us. And you don't have to commit to each month, but just starting next week, if we have five or six people that would go along and just would pray. And I um, know you'll have to wear masks to go in there, um, but what, uh, just, just to have some people to go along. Um, you don't have to lead music, but plan on joining us in music as we lead worship there. Again, that'll be once a month we're doing that. So if you're interested in going next week, please see me after the service, and I'll just note that you're going to be going with us. Okay? Um, and then on the 9th, you guys know once a month we've been doing a snack or a meal or something for Heritage Nursing Home for the workers. Uh, there's about 120 workers each month we've done something for. Well, our last one of the year is coming up on the 9th of, and we'll announce this again next week, but the 9th. And we're going to be, we've, we're getting chicken from Kroger's, and we're going to be making sides to go with it. And so we need some help with it that day. And so if you're able to help on the 9th, um, I believe that's a Thursday. Um, if you're available, please see me that we can add you to that to help with that. And again, we'll announce that next week as well. Um, next week, we'll be focusing, starting our focus on Lottie Moon, the time where we collect money for international missions. And we do that through the month of December. And so we'll be talking more about that next week. Um, but today, we have a special collection. Uh, we've been collecting money, money today and food for our food pantry. Um, and so um, you probably saw a bunch of canned goods and stuff out there. We've just had a great number of people requesting food this year that we haven't had in the past. Um, normally, we're 50 to 70 people a week that we're serving. And the last few weeks, we've been in the, in the 100 range. Uh, one week, we had 125. And, um, and we've been blessed. The Catholic school did a collection, and so we had some food from them. And another lady um, brought us turkeys, and we had like a nine or ten, ten turkeys I think we had to give out, but we just need to help kind of boost that up a little bit, and so um, if you're able to provide with that, we appreciate that this morning. Um, as we get ready for our offering, I want to remind you that our offering is for our members and regular attenders. If you're visiting with us, we don't ask that you put anything in that offering plate other than a visitor card that's in the pews there that we have a record of your attendance. Uh, we're not looking for you to contribute to the church in any way. Um, I want to invite uh, those that are helping with the offering if they would come forward at this time Mike Rowe would you pray for us move into a time of Advent. This is the first week where we recognize Advent, and we'll be looking at that th now through the Christmas season. And, and the Advent wreath 
is a teaching tool that's been around for hundreds of years. And it's exactly that, a tool. It's, there's nothing overly special about it, but it's a tool to help us recognize and remember what Advent is about. Advent means coming or arriving, or, or sometimes we use the word appearing to describe Advent. Our Lord's Advent, or coming to earth, was a history-changing, life-changing event. His, had baby Jesus not been born in that manger in Bethlehem, we would not have the man Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. It's one of the reasons I love that we were able to, to in the book of Mark, and talk about the resurrection just before Christmas. Those two are so closely tied together. And yet, he's not done. Advent has historically tied Jesus' first coming, that, 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 that manger at Bethlehem, to Jesus' second coming. The first advent of Jesus Christ sets up the hope of believers in the promised second advent. And we as believers and, and the creation itself are waiting for Jesus to come again. The Advent wreath teaches us to bring the two Advents, the one that happened 2,000 plus years ago, to that one that's quickly coming, that Jesus is second Advent. The basic Advent wreath consists of a circle, usually surrounded by evergreens, which we have with four candles, three purple and one pink, and then a white candle in the center. The circle in that wreath reminds us of God himself, his eternity, his endless mercy, which has no beginning and no end. The green of the wreath speaks of the hope we have in God, newness, renewal, revival, eternal life. And the candles, the candles remind us that Christ, the light of the world, has come into our sin-darkened world to bring newness, to bring life, and to bring hope. The four outer candles represent a period of waiting between the prophet Malachi and the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. And so each Sunday between now and Christmas, we'll be lighting a candle, plus we'll, each week we'll light the previous candles that we've, that we've lit the previous week. And so um, this helps to symbolize our waiting um, as we anticipate the coming of the Lord. So each new candle reminds us that something is happening, but also that more is yet to come. So this morning, as we light our first candle, it represents the hope that we have in Jesus' name. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the hope we have in Jesus Christ. That it is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that, that we can be made right, that we can have eternal life found only in you. Lord, help us this Christmas season as we look at this Advent wreath, be reminded of the hope we have in Christ. Lord, help us today as we look at what hope means in the Bible to focus our attention fully on you and not be distracted, be distracted with things around us or things outside or things on our mind of later in the day. All those distractions, take them away. Help us fully focus our attention on you and let you be glorified through our worship. Let our songs, our words, our praises, our scripture, the message itself be pleasing and honoring to you. Let it, let it draw us closer to you, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We praise you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. This is what uh, Psalm 98, verses 4 through 8 says. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let's all of us sing together for joy as we stand, as you're able to sing joy to the world. The Lord is come. Joy 
sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing joy to the earth the savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and floods rocks hills and plains repeat the sounding joy repeat the sounding joy Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make the blessings flow, far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love, and wonders of his love. And wonders, wonders of his love. Come, thou long expected Jesus. Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel, strength and consolation. Hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart, born thy people to child and yet a king born to reign in us forever now thy gracious kingdom bring by thine own eternal spirit rule in all Merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's continue in worship and sing, O come all ye faithful. Oh, 
angels who come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord sing choirs of angels sing in exultation oh sing all ye bright hopes of heaven above glory to God glory in the highest oh come let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee for Happy morning, Jesus, to thee be all glory give. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Please have a seat. if you're like me, but I look forward all year to the Christmas songs that we sing. I just It's just a joy to, to sing those praises at Christmas time. It's just a gift, isn't it? Um, reminder that we will have, um, just some of you are making plans for the coming month, I should announce this earlier, but we will have a Christmas Eve service um, on on Christmas Eve, <laughs> and um, but um, the Wednesday before Christmas Eve, we will not have service that night, okay, but we will have services each Wednesday up until then, but that Wednesday of the week before Christmas, we will not have service in lieu of a Christmas Eve service that night, okay. Today we're in, our main text is in Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to be in verses 6 and 7. Now, you know, I typically have a lot more verses than that, um, but don't worry, <laughs> Even though that's our main text, we actually have more scripture in today's message than I think we ever have. Um, we're going to cover a lot of scripture as we look at the hope found in Jesus Christ. And we look at hope named is what I've titled this today. We're going to be looking at, G looking at Jesus in his indescribably unique ways. You know, names tell us something, don't they? Most parents spend a significant amount of time trying to decide what to name their children. I know most parents, when, we, when our kids were little, before our kids were born, we, spent, we had the baby book, right? And how many of you had that baby book? You would spend flipping through, looking at all the different various names. And I'm sure today it's an internet version that people look at and <coughs> excuse me, try to figure out, <coughs> excuse me, try to figure out what to name their children. So why is it? Why do we do that? Because we know a name is something more than just, just something we go by, isn't it? Some people are very strategic and specific when it comes to choosing names. Many of you probably know the story of George Foreman. George Foreman, the famous boxer, he had ten children, and he named all five of his boys George. Yep. He even named one of his girls Georgetta. 
Well, in the Old Testament times, a name stood for a person's reputation. It, it, it stood for their fame. It stood for their glory. So the word translated name literally means a mark or a brand. Parents often, often gave names to children to describe their hopes and their future expectations regarding a child. A study of, of Bible's names reveals much about the personality and the person being named. For instance, David. David means beloved. Abraham. Abraham means a father of a multitude. Jacob. No picking on Jacob Kimbrew, but Jacob means deceiver. Isaac implies laughter. Moses means drawn out. Jesus is Jehovah saves. These people in the Bible, they prove true of their names. And today, as we recognize the hope found in Jesus, we're going to look at the fourfold name given to Jesus in our text today. These names were given 700 years prior to him being born. And we will still see that Jesus is indescribably unique. So first, let us examine a turn from, from gloom to gladness. Isaiah's primary purpose was to remind his readers of the special relationship they had with God and his covenant community. The nation had experienced prosperity, but now Assyria was about to attack them. In the midst of this impending threat, Isaiah gives a number of great promises. The original birth announcement was made in the midst of, of grief and gloom. Before we get to our main text, look at Isaiah 9.1. It says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Zebulun and Naphtali, they are tribes from the north of Israel, making up the land of Galilee. For many years, the people only knew grief because of ta attacks from enemies that were unleashed um, by God as a result of their sins. But Isaiah, he tells them of a time in the future where this gloom, all this despair they're, fa they're facing, is going to be replaced with a gladness in Galilee. Verse 2 goes on to describe how the birth of Christ will bring brightness to a world of despair and darkness. It says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. We'll be talking about Jesus as the light of the world in another message um, later, this, later in December, but, but I want to mention that when people are in the dark, they can't see, and, and, and they end up stumbling through life with no sense of direction. If we're to help those who are, are dwelling in darkness, those of us who are Christian must make sure that we're giving off a pleasant aroma. I've talked to you before about a, a friend's book years ago that she wrote. It was called The Aroma of Christ. And, you know, someone may not be able to, to see, but they can still spell, smell the aroma of Christ coming from those who follow him. And 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved, those who are perishing. What, what are you showing to the world around you? Continuing on, jump down to verse 4. We read, the enemies of Israel had, had burdened the people with, the, it says, the yoke that burdened them, the bar cross, across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. When the light of life comes, the heavy yoke will be shattered. Instead of wiping us out, Jesus says in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, it says, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In the place of burdens, God wants us to have blessing. So with that in context, let us go to our main text today. We're going to camp out here for a little bit, but um, let's just start off with verse 6. We're going to split this up. Follow along as I read. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called... These are the four names I mentioned. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Second we, thing we see in this text is a child and a son. 
we see here the, the, these indescribable uniquenesses of Jesus and the central truth of Christianity. It says, for to us, a child is born. This describes his birth as a baby. It shows his humanity as a man. And it says to us, a son is given. Jesus is God's son, uh, given as a gift. It shows the humility he has in his deity. The child was born in Bethlehem, and the gift of eternal son was given to us. One commentator I read about, read, reminded us, he said, the son wasn't born, the son existed eternally. The child was born, but the son was given. That's kind of deep. It may take a little bit to think through that. On top of that, the government will be on his shoulders. The, the baby bumble, bundled in the straw holds the universe together. The one nestled on Mary's shoulder bears everything on his shoulders. He's redeemer. He's ruler of all. You know, when we lived overseas, they, they celebrate their Christmas celebration. We can talk about another time in the Czech Republic. It was very different. But their focus was on baby Jesus. Baby Jesus brought gifts. Baby Jesus this, baby Jesus that. The whole focus was on baby Jesus. The problem was that while they recognized baby Jesus, they didn't recognize the man Jesus so often. That man Jesus holds the universe together. Again, he's redeemer, ruler of all. At Christmas, a time when this miracle should be understood so clearly, it's often a time that we miss the point. Sometimes people become bored as the focus is on this infant Jesus. The phrase, and he shall be called, means he will justly bear the name. Technically, all four of these descriptions make up his name. You see that it's sin singular? It doesn't say name, but it says name. Similar to when we talk about in Galatians 5, when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes people call it the fruits of the Spirit, but it's not. It's the fruit of the Spirit. We can't pick and choose of it like a buffet. Let's look at how his fourfold name is described now. First of all, Jesus speaks to us. He stands for us. He sits near us, and he satisfies within. Again, he's indescribably unique. The first name we see is he speaks to us as Wonderful Counselor. The title literally means a wonder of a counselor. Wonderful Counselor. The word wonderful means full of wonder, full of glory, exceptional, astonishing, extraordinary. In Judges 13, 18, the angel of the Lord says, he replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. In Isaiah 29, 14, it says, therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon, upon wonder. The wisdom of Wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Psalm 77, 14, it says, You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. And this word, wonderful, it's coupled with the word counselor, which refers to an advisor or a consultant. You know, our life is, is full of decisions, isn't it? There's a lot of details. There's many disasters we face through life. We need a wonderful counselor. David wrote in, in Psalm 16, 7, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. Another example is Isaiah 11, 1. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. In the next verse, the Messiah is referring to us having the spirit of, of counsel and of might. It says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You ever thought of what, what makes someone a good counselor? Maybe you've had experience with a really good counselor, or you've had the opposite, and you understand what it means to have good counsel. When we're in need, we, we want, first of all, a counselor who's available to us, right? Someone who gives our undivided attention. We want to go to a counselor who's got his phone out, and, and he's looking at his phone and saying, yeah, okay, go ahead, keep going. And, and they look, No, we want someone giving us their undivided attention. 
and we want someone who's able to provide comfort while remaining confidential. We don't want to share uh, our problem or what we're facing with someone and they go and tell everyone else about it. You want confidentiality. And then we want someone who can tell the truth about ourselves while giving us what we need to make changes. In short, we want someone who has empathy, expertise, and experience. However, keep in mind that as our wonderful counselor, Christ is not just someone who makes suggestions. Tim Keller, he wrote a book called Hidden Christmas. I want to read a passage from it. He says, when you come to Christ, you must drop your conditions. You have to give up the right to say, I will obey you if. I will do this if. As soon as you say, I will obey you if, this is not obedience at all. You're saying, you are my advisor, not my Lord. I will be happy to take your recommendations. And I might even do some of them. No, if you want Jesus with you, you have to give up the right to self-determination. Self-denial is an act of rebellion against our late modern culture of self-assertion. But that is what we're called to do. Nothing less. Today I ask you, is Jesus your wonderful counselor? Are you willing to follow Christ without condition? No ifs, ands, or buts. Without condition, are you willing to follow him? Second thing we see is that he stands for us as mighty God. Mighty God. The word mighty means strong one or powerful, a valiant warrior. In Isaiah 9, the, the objective, adjective mighty literally means God hero. Jesus is the hero of the scripture story. David asked the question in Psalm 24, 8, Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He's profound in his counsel, and he has the power to accomplish what he wills. This part of his name, it, it tells us that Jesus is not only the Son of God, he's also God the Son. The baby born in that manger is also the King of glory. Or to say it another way, the, the humble carpenter of Nazareth is also the mighty architect of the universe. Jesus can manage anything because he is mighty. He heals the lame, the blind, the sick. He calmed the storms. He brought Lazarus back from the grave. Therefore, he can do the impossible in your life right now. He can give you victory over whatever you're struggling with. Let him fight your battles as you honor him. Worship him as your warrior and praise him for his power. Remember the word spoken to the angel, by the angel to Mary in Luke 137? It says, for no word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. Some, some translations Say, for nothing is impossible with God. Writer Ray Pritchard once wrote, as the wonderful counselor, he makes the plan. As the mighty God, he makes that plan work. I, I ask you a second question today. Are you trusting in your own strength? Or are you ready to recognize him as your mighty God? Again, Jesus is indescribably unique. The third name we see in this list is he sits near us as everlasting father. Many people see God as distant. They, they recognize that he's powerful, but they don't know him on a personal level. They don't realize that he's also personal. They may have a sense of awe, but again, they don't know him personally. In Jesus, he has come near. In this third description of his name, we see Jesus is everlasting, meaning he is before above and beyond time literally means that he lives forever he lives in the forever isaiah 57 15 says for this is what the high and exalted one says he who lives forever whose name is holy i live in a high and holy place but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite he lives forever, and he loves like a father. Christ is holy and human, and he sits near us. 
There's a story I read of a, of a young Cali student, long hair, tattoos, holy t-shirt, old jeans, shoes without socks, and, and this young man becomes a Christian. And located next to the campus is an old church. This old church wanted to develop a, a ministry to reach out to the Cali students, but they didn't know how. They kept talking about ways they could reach Cali students. They just didn't know how. Well, one day, this young Cali student who had just recently become a Christian decided he'd go to church there. He walks in. He's a little bit late. He's wearing his everyday wardrobe. He can't find a seat because the church is pretty full. So he starts walking toward the front. People notice him. They're wa he's walking down the center, and they're people are coming a little bit uncomfortable watching him as he gets toward the front. Seeing no seats anywhere, he gets up to the front, and he just sits down on the floor. Now, this was acceptable for a, a college fellowship, but it wasn't done in church. The congregation became more and more uptight. Tension began to fill the air. And then they noticed a deacon. The deacon was in his 80s, and that man starts making his way toward the young man, walking down the middle of the church. He was a distinguished man, silver hair, he had a nice suit on, he walked with a cane. Eddie made his way toward the young man. People began to be relieved as the idea that something was going to take, take place, that someone was going to address this and tell the young man that he shouldn't be sitting there on the floor. It takes time for the man to make his way to him as he walks slowly. The church becomes silent as you just hear the clicking of the man's walking and his cane along the floor. All eyes focused on them. When he finally reaches the college kid, he drops his cane to the floor. And with great difficulty, he lowers himself to the floor and he says, may I sit with you? May I join you? That illustration brings two thoughts to mind. First of all, Jesus calls us to reach out, to get near to all those that God considers dear, which is everyone. Are you reaching out? Are you, are you reaching out to those around you? Or are you sitting back and just judging? Second, this is similar to what God did when he sent his son. Jesus entered our world, and he wants to sit down in relationship with us. Jesus, a child and a son, he's also eternally like a father to us. Now, I'm fortunate I had an incredibly good father. I know some of you have struggled because you don't, haven't had that, that positive father image. As you see the Savior in the stable this Christmas season, season, focus on the fact that he is your forever father who cares for you with compassion. Psalm 103, 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Notice how tender the Savior Isaiah is in 40, 11. It says, he tends his flocks like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. He's speaking to the young parent in these verses. And again, it's, it's a, there's a tenderness in these verses. Will you allow him to sit by you? To join you. The fourth name we see in this list, he satisfies within as Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. There are many studies that, that paint a portrait of society in deep trouble these days. These, these studies, they, 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 they outline things like, like, like suicide being so prevalent, drug overdose. They talk about liver disease becoming more and more of an almost an epidemic. We have people who are giving up, particularly young people, giving up on life, sometimes before it really even starts for them. Acts of desperation. It wasn't that long ago, I was talking to one of our local policemen in Streeter, and, and he was telling me about, about Narcan, a, a, a drug, a rescue drug that, that can help someone who's overdosed. And he said, on a daily occurrence, they're having to use Narcan in Streeter. Daily. We could add to this acts of mass violence and abuse. Folks, Jesus comes into our desperation with a promise of peace within. It's peace within. The phrase prince of peace can be, can be translated, the prince who's coming brings peace. 
a prince in the Bible, was the general of the army, and described leadership, it it described authority. In the Old Testament, there was the word shalom. And when it was used as a greeting, it was a wish for for outward freedom from disturbances. It it was a wish for an inward sense of well-being. And it was a typical greeting, shalom. But the best greeting, the best greeting, the premier greeting to give someone was to offer them peace. Peace given to a people constantly harassed by enemies. In Numbers 6, 24 through 26, God gave Moses these words to use when blessing his people. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Peace. Maybe you're searching for peace today. Hold on to Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose mind are steadfast because they trust in you. You know, the New Testament talks of of at least three different areas of peace. First of all, it talks about peace with God. Peace with God. This is the vertical dimension. And then it talks about peace of God. Peace of God. This is the internal peace that we're talking about today. And then there's peace with others. That's that horizontal dimension that we're talking about. Jesus has come to put together, as Ephesians 2.14 states, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, for he himself is our peace. He himself, Jesus Christ, is our peace. Again, I ask you today, are you out of alignment with God? Receive that Prince of Peace into your life. Be made right with him. Maybe you're full of stress inside. You feel that anxiety. Give your anxiety to the Almighty. Let his unexplained peace give you that calm in the midst of chaos. Maybe you have relationships with others that are damaged. I encourage you, do the hard work of being a peacemaker. And again, I ask, do you know him as your Prince of Peace? And the third thing we see in today's text is second advent. Incredibly, Jesus was named 700 years before he was born. We're talking about his indescribably uniqueness. He speaks to us. He stands for us. He sits near us. And he satisfies within. Good news is we can experience all of that right now. And even better news is that there's more to come not the end. We get a taste today, but all these titles will be fully realized when he returns to rule and reign. Jesus came in the cradle in order to go to the cross. When he comes again, he'll be wearing a crown. Look at, look at our second verse today. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this second verse, but look at Isaiah 9-7. It says, of the greatness of his government and peace. There will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. One of the famous songs often sang at Christmas time is Handel's Messiah. This verse reminds me of that. The kingdom of this world, that song says, is is become the king of our Lord. And he shall reign forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever. God makes a promise to King David in 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13. He says, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now stick with me. We're going to walk through this for a minute. So we have this promise that God makes to King David in 2 Samuel. And after David dies, Solomon, he, he falls into sin, and he ends up becoming disqualified. But if you read through the book of Kings and Chronicles, you see that this covenant promise remains front and center. 
as king after king, they disobey, they, they disqualify themselves. A longing develops for a king to come who could fulfill the conditions, to fulfill all the conditions of the covenant and to sit on David's throne to rule and reign forever. Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4 says it clearly. It says, you said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. In Luke 1, Gabriel was sent out to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of, catch this, David. The virgin's name was Mary. When Gabriel gave God's message to Mary, he referred to this covenant with David in Luke 1, 31 to 33. It says, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You were to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. King David is listed five times in the family tree of Jesus found in Matthew 1. Why is that? Because first and foremost, Jesus Christ is a direct descendant of David and therefore qualifies as eternal king. I love the last phrase of, of 9-7. It says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The world, word zeal means an intense desire. God has great desire to see his plan of redemption accomplished in your life. Catch that? He wants to see his plan of redemption accomplished in your life. The phrase Lord of hosts means Lord of armies. God has at least three different kinds of armies at his disposal. He uses national armies like, like in Babylon. He used them to accomplish his purposes. He enlists the creation army to do his bidding. And then he drafts the angelic army to do his work. Here's something really cool today, guys. The Lord of the armies, of all three of these, he uses all three armies to activate his plan that first Christmas. He mobilized the, the Roman government to call for a census so Jesus could be born in Bethlehem. He caused the stars of heaven to burn bright enough to give attention to astrologists living hundreds of miles away in another country. And he unleashed an army of angels to announce the good news of the Savior's birth to some shepherds. One more question for you to consider. Do you realize that God is exceedingly zealous for you? He loves you beyond what you can fathom. And he's arranged all the details of his plan to deliver you from the bondage of sin and is offering to stand for you, to sit near you, to satisfy within. All of these prepositions are designed to enable you to know Christ personally. You know, it's, it's often common these days for people to believe that all religions are basically the same. Maybe you've heard that. David Platt described a time when he was in a conversation with two other guys who followed two different religions. He spoke up. He said, it's almost like you guys picture God at the top of a mountain and we're all at the bottom, and, and I may take this path, and, and you may take that path, and, and, but we all end up in that same place. They smiled, and they said, exactly, now you understand. And Platt said, then, well, what if I told you that that God at the top of the mountain didn't wait for us to find our way up to him, but he actually came down to where we are? They responded and said, well, that'd be great. To which he responded, that's the difference. What we find in the Bible is the story of God who has not left us alone to try to find our way to him, but has come to us and has made the way for us through Jesus. The gift of Christ, it's a personal gift from God to us. But folks, a gift requires a response. If I put a gift under the Christmas tree, you may acknowledge it being there. You may admire it. You may even thank me for it. But it's not yours until you open it and take it for yourself. 
You can be confident that when you take Christ, you'll get exactly what he promises. Forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Will you call out to the only name given under heaven by which you can be saved? You know, each week we have a time of invitation, a time where we invite you to to do just that, to call out to God, to begin a new walk with him. If you've never done that, we invite you to do so today. I plead with you to do so today. Don't put off making a decision. Don't, I know the Christmas songs are fun to sing, and, and there's so much beauty about Christmas, but don't miss the meaning. Don't miss that it's about a baby being born that allows a way for us to be saved. We invite you to come and make that decision today. Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We invite you to come, repent, and begin that walk. It doesn't promise that your life's going to be perfect. No, but he promises eternal life. He promises forgiveness of sins. Maybe you've done that in the past, and you've never followed in, in the testimony of baptism. I would love to talk to you about that. Maybe God's calling you to, to you've been worshiping with us, and you're, you're, God's calling you to come and begin the process of joining our church. Again, it's whatever God is laying on your heart. It's not between me and you and God. It's between you and God. All we offer is a time to make those decisions here. I want to invite those that are leading our worship, our music, to come back at this time. And if you would please stand with us. Please join me in prayer. Father God, you are indescribably unique. We thank you for coming to earth and and dying in our place on the cross and then rising on that third day. I would ask that you would help each of us today to, to consider who you are and what you've done and what you are offering. For any that are listening today, whether in person or online, that do not know you as Lord and Savior, help them to repent from sin, to turn to you right now. You are the only one that can save us. Lord, we invite you, please, be our wonderful counselor, be our mighty God, our everlasting Father, and our Prince of Peace. Help us to submit, help us to surrender to your reign and your rule. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.